restrictions if you want. You understand, Lee? Okay, y'all working on your introduction, right? Your introduction needs to have your name at the top of the page and a brief intro and the title of your speech. Do you understand? Yeah. You said no. Luke. No, who said no, really? Testing one, two. Now I have audio. Cool. All right. So we should push buttons, turn knobs, get check. That's all good. All right. Sorry about all this. All right. Luke, would you pick up all the introductions for me, please? So stand up and walk around and, and hand it to you. Emily, is yours done? And Luke has it? Jerry, do you have yours? It needs to be third person. I'll change it. I'll change it. I'm smart enough I can change it. Austin, Amy, Gabriel. Thank you. What? Whose is this? Jerry, really? You didn't have a whole piece of paper? No. And you couldn't get off your assets and come up here and do it? Get it? Here you go. I need to be able to read it here. Thank you. Your introduction needs to be more than three words. It needs to be more than three words. It needs to be a complete sentence identifying what your speech is going to be about. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you, dear. Is that too hard? All right. Can I have a volunteer who is not shy about choosing the order for me? It's going to be random. Just anyone, not you. Lee, come on up. All right, so hold on. I've got, I've got a list of who's going to be first, second, and third here. I had a pencil. Here you go. So you pick one. It, it, uh, obviously, reading's going to be last or close to last. Yes. So just pick one and hand it to me. You can close your eyes and just grab one. Oh. Oh. Yeah, what is this? I don't know. Okay, yours? Who? Just tell me. Austin. Yeah. Okay, Austin's first. Here's a number one. Congratulations. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Thank you. No, no, no. I need all of them, dear. Oh, here we go. Never mind. I'll do it. I need something. Yeah. Uh, whose is this? I asked you to put your name on the top of the paper. Oh, that's mine. Thank you, Catherine. Hi everyone. My name is Johnetta Barnett. For the last nine weeks, I've been teaching your students how to public speak, how to say things in public and tell a story. I have tried to be as understanding as I can with all of these students. Actually, they are a great class. One thing that we all know is they all came to, into this class with a certain amount of knowledge. And I have tried to inform them that there are certain ways to have a public speech effectively. The first thing they need to do is to prepare. Every, before every class, they needed to prepare a speech. We have been giving speeches in every class. And today, they are going to give one of their speeches that they have either given before or have prepared for today's speech. The objective for their speech is to provide an introduction and an ending. I asked each one of the students to focus on providing a speech that is interesting to the audience. The first thing you need to do when you give a public speech is to know your audience. What type of audience are you giving your speech to? Is it a business speech? Is it a public speech? Are you trying to send a message? Are you trying to persuade someone? Are you just trying to be entertaining? Today, these students will all tell stories of some kind, whether it's interesting to you but they're hoping that it is. And we've chosen the order of all of these students in random order. Now, we have asked them to deliver their speech within a time limit of four minutes to six minutes. At four minutes, I'll hold up a green card in the back of the room, and I will be the timer. And during the speech, I'll jot down notes. And each one of the students during their class time have received evaluation, encouraging remarks from their fellow students, observing whether they stand like a statue, start every word with um, which is not desirable, whether they engage with the audience, they look around and they talk to the audience. You'll see that every student is different. Every student brings their own energy and their own experiences to their speeches. Some are seventh graders and some are fourth graders. So there is a different level in the type of students we have here. So I asked all the students to do their best with who they are. And that's who we have today. So we have seven students, and no, we have nine, 10 students, and one of them is 
on her way. It is actually her birthday day, and she's having a party. So when she comes, we're going to welcome her and ask, you know, she, it might or might not be a disruption, but she is also prepared to speak. I want to um, tell you that thank you for uh, coming to To the Top Education. They actually provide ed different types of education for all your students all year round, and it's a great organization. I'm going to go and get a drink of water, and then I'm going to start introducing the kids. So give me about 30 seconds. Thank you very much. always practice. Every time we come up to the stage, we get an applause. Okay. And Luke, come up here. I'm going to put you on the spot because there's a right way and a wrong way to shake someone's hand. So come up and show me the right way to shake my hand. You see, he looked me in the eye and he shook my hand. And that's a good way. Thank you. You may sit down. Now, everyone who comes up to the stage owns the stage. It is their place to be. So you can do and say and move all on your space. So I'm releasing permission for that person to be up here with my handshake. Now, the order of our speakers are, our first speaker is Austin, our second speaker is Catherine, our third speaker is Luke, our fourth speaker is Amy, Carter is fifth, Gabriel is sixth, Emily is seventh, Tao is eighth, and Reedy will be our final speaker. I will take notes and I'll provide notes to you via an email later on this evening to let you know what I thought. Praise, I always praise, inform, and praise you on how you did. And my final thoughts are what I really loved about your speech. So as you're listening to these students, think about how they succeeded at the objective of engaging the audience, using vocal variety, and having a beginning and a middle and an end to their story. All right, so please welcome our first speaker today is Austin. He will be giving a story. Come on up, Austin. Today, Austin will be giving a story about D-Day from the perspective of an American soldier. The title of the story is Three Hours in Hell. Please welcome Austin. Okay, so don't start your story until I get back there. Thank you, and I need my timing device. It's July 6, 1944. Private First Class Ben Smith sat in a Higgins boat on the USS Arizona in the middle of the brutal, sickening Atlantic Ocean. The rhythmic sound of waves hitting the ironclad ship and the constant roar of wind left Ben in a trance of thought. The fresh 18-year-old recruit from Virginia kept on asking himself one question, why am I here? Although he very well knew the answer, he wanted to defeat Adolf Hitler, the same man that brainwashed his own birth country. That's right. 
Ben was German, and his real name was Ben Schmidt. All right, soldiers. T minus 20 minutes before we land, Sergeant Sanders Park. When we land, just put your head down and run. There was a murmur of concern amongst the soldiers. Even the veterans looked scared. Boom, boom. As they got closer, Ben could hear the big American warships firing onto the shore in an attempt to destroy the defenses and provide cover for them. Ben peeked out of the boat to see dozens, if not hundreds, of other Higgins boats, identical to the one he was on. Each boat either carried 40 men, two Sherman tanks, or crates of supplies. T minus one minute, Sergeant Sanders barked. Ben clutched his rifles, making his knuckles turn wider than snow. There was a good chance that he would not make it back to the States alive. The Higgins boat suddenly hit a sandbar, making Ben lurch five inches forward, even with the 50 pounds of gear on his back. And then the ramp dropped down to his feet. Ben ran, ran, and ran. He could hear the rain of bullets as they peered through the ranks of men, followed by their horrifying screams. But Ben did not stop to look, because if he did, Ben, uh, he would likely end up just like them. Ben spotted a sand ditch just 10 feet away from him. He planted his feet and changed direction, sprinting towards the ditch. His thick combat boots dug into the sand as bullets and explosions filled the smoky air. Five feet, a bullet narrowly whizzes past his feet. Four feet, a soldier in front of him was shot dead. Three feet, two feet, one feet, a mortar round explodes behind him, flinging him into the ditch. Despite coughing up sand and a few scratches, he was in one piece. Unfortunately, Ben had lost his rifles in the mortar at last, as it was dug into the sand 15 feet away. He peeked his head just enough so that he could see the beach, and what he saw was a nightmare. Blood and bodies littered the beach. The sand looked like it had been dyed dark red from the bloodshed, and each dead body looked like a small stone on a vast beach. In the distance, Ben could see another load of men on a Higgins boat docked onto the shore. No, go back. Don't lower that ramp. Stay on the boat, Ben said. But they couldn't hear him. Not even he had a megaphone. Not even the bullets and shelling stopped. They dropped the ramp. And in an instant, the bullets returned directly towards them. Ben looked away as bullets poured through the ranks of men as they fell screaming into the water. Amazingly, another soldier made it off the boat alive and started running towards Ben's position. He jumped into the ditch, panting. Let's run to the seawall over there, the soldier said trying to breathe. Ben peeked his head again, just enough to see a line of soldiers crouched against the seawall, where the German guns could not hit him. Once the mortars and cannon fire we get again, we run, the soldier said. A few seconds later, in unison, the mortars fired shells high into the air. Ben took a quick glance at the soldier before taking off running. Bullets hit the sand all around him, taking up sand and blinding him as he ran. Ben tripped over a dead body, making him fall down onto the beach. He got back up and continued running towards the seawall. By now, he could see the row of about 30 soldiers at the seawall. Go, go, go! Ben heard one of the soldiers say. One bullet scathed him in the arm, leaving a big burning gash in his arm as he lunged behind the seawall like a football player might be making a tackle. I have to be the luckiest soldier in Omaha Beach, Ben thought. He gazed at the line of exhausted soldiers as he crawled back to the back of the line. What has once supposed to be been an organized mission has now turned into hell. Alright, soldiers, we have enough people to start an assault on a German bunker, a lieutenant by the name of Taylor said. Ben nodded along with the other soldiers. Even though he had survived the last hour or two of hell, the mission hadn't been fulfilled yet, and it was his job to fulfill it. There's a hole in the seawall over there. That's our way in and out. Now let's get off this beach, Taylor cried. It was only now that Ben had forgotten something very important. His rifle. He crawled to a dead soldier that was just a few inches short of making, making it to the seawall and pushed the rifle out of his own. Thanks, man, Ben whispered, and I'm sorry. Everybody through the hole now, Lieutenant Cr Taylor cried. Ben ran behind his comrades as they made their way through the hole in the seawall. One of the soldiers threw a smoke grenade to cover the boots movement. Soon, they came upon a trench with a tripod machine gun and dozen of Nazi soldiers. Covered by the smoke grenades, the GIs blasted the Nazis' rifles of their arms and popped into the trench. Ben took aim at one of the soldiers and shot him dead with his rifle. Then he and the others started advancing to the concrete bunker just 70 steps away. The bunker door led to a dark hallway, lit by one flickering light. Ben and the other soldiers walked slowly checking every inch of the bunker. Out of the blue, multiple gunshots rang out and a soldier in front of Ben went down. 
The GIs responded by firing back repeatedly until the threat was eliminated. Ben had done it. He had survived Omaha Beach. He, along with his other soldiers, had attacked a German bunker and won. But this ha his happiness quickly wore off when he took a peek peak when it through the bunker windows. Through the thinning smoke, he saw tanks burn, jeeps crushed, sinking landing craft, and thousands of dead bodies littered on the beach. But with many German fortifications taken out by Ben and the other GIs, the invasion finally started to look more organized. Tanks moved up the beach with soldiers behind them. Soldiers were moving through the sea on multiple places, and controlled explosions took out more German defenses. Our orders are to advance further inland and capture the village of Lacroix, Lieutenant Taylor said. After all, D-Day ain't over yet. Along with his comrades, they marched towards the village, towards Hitler, towards victory. Thank you, Austin. See, he's waiting to release the stage back to me. All right. So, everybody, everybody, that was Austin. Thank you. This is Catherine, huh? I will. Here, help me out. Our second speaker today is Catherine. The sad story of my quails. Have you ever had a pet that wasn't born into the world to, and just died? Well, if so, you can probably relate to her story of how her pet quail, this is a bird, unlived. Is unalived? Unalive, that's her term for today. So please welcome Catherine. Don't start until I get back there and give you a nod. Remember to take a deep breath and look around the audience. Um, it was in August in 2020, and my mom ordered quail eggs on Amazon. One of my friend, mom's friends raised some quails and we wanted to try it. My mom looked at some reviews and picked the one that had the, one of the best results. It was very exciting for me and my sister because the quails would be our first pets. They arrived about two weeks later and we put them on a paper towel to help them breathe fresh air. Well, that's at least what my mom said. After 24 hours, we put them in the incubator and left them alone. We have. We, we had to flip them every day at least two times, like at noon and in the morning, for the eggs to be warm on both sides. Also, we, for some reason, had to pet them after flipping them. Um, then, on the 20th day, one of the eggs hatched early in the morning. I was very excited. The quail was really small and cute. It was like the size of my palm, but smaller. We named it Melon. Don't ask why we named it that. Two days later, when I came back from school, the quail disappeared. So my mom thought it was taken away by something or just escaped. Me and my sister thought that a rat had taken away to eat it. And ever since that day, we have loathed and hated, hated rats. I cried a lot that day and became super depressed. The next day, another quail hatched. I was really excited and I named the quail potato. 
Again, don't ask about the name. But then I realized that it was physically weak and very frail. It would fall at the slightest touch. It died again. I became a lot more depressed than when the first quail died. The weird thing was that I became depressed at their deaths, even though I only knew the, both quails for like, I don't know, like two days at the most. We made a funeral for, for, for Potato at my old house, but I don't even remember where the location is now. That was one of, my, one of the most depressing experiences of my life. Also, one day, I found a bird under the bush in my old house a few months after the quails died. I looked up what kind of bird it was and found out that it was a quail. The idea that it was the quail that disappeared did not cross my mind because I was pretty dumb at that moment and the only thing I wanted to do was catch the bird. I didn't actually catch the bird because I thought it had rabies. But then, my mom's car ran over it and it died. I saw the corpse. I still wonder if, the, if it was the quail that disappeared because it was all grown up and it was right in front of my house living in the bushes. But I feel like I'll never find out. And that's the end of my speech. Thank you for your time. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our third speaker is Luke. Please welcome Luke. Today, Luke is going to tell us a story about the history behind Legos. Please welcome Luke. Hello, everyone. My name is Luke. Today, I'm going to tell you the history behind Lego. But before I start my story, I want to ask you guys a question. Do you guys like Legos? I mean, come on, it's one of the most popular toys I've got right now. For my opinion, Legos are my best thing for entertainment. But do you ever wonder how Lego even got its name, how it was even invented? Well, let me tell you the story. It all started many, many years ago. Around 1920 or 30, if I remember, there was a very skilled craftsman and a carpenter. He had three, four boys and a wife. But during that time, it was very hard for him because his company isn't really selling the things that he is supposed to, you know, isn't selling much. His company is not really the one that blew up immediately. Since that's, since that's, a, very pro that's a problem right now, he was forced to dismiss his last worker. His name is Ollie. He's this really guy who created Legos. And let's just say, Ollie was not really happy about that, about that thing he just did to his worker. One of his last workers he will ever have. And now lost. And here's the thing though. His wife gave him support, which does give him some hope. But unfortunately, Ollie eventually lost his wife. But Ollie is not the type that gave up right away. He, he had, remember, remember somebody had four boys? Yeah, they were pretty young, but they were, they had nothing to play with besides go outside and look at the animals and stuff. And that gave Ollie an idea inside his head and decided to put his idea into action. Luckily, with his carpenter business he did in the past, he saved up a lot, a lot of wood. So he used those wood to make a ton of wooden toys. His creation made his boy so happy and encouraged him to make more toys. E even though Ollie's a very skilled craftsman and a good carpenter, let's just say his sales were not really, you know, not really fast. You see, back in the back in, during that time, they don't really have you no know, computers and stuff, so they had to type and this thing. Ollie, he is a very slow typer, but luckily his son, named Goffred, one of his four kids, decided to help him after school. That really made sales go a lot more faster. 
Word spread about the very high quality wooden toys, and a man came into town, a man that would change all these futures forever. When the man came in, he was extremely impressed with the things he made, made by Ollie. The wooden toys are very impressive. They have made with good precision, and they are made of good quality, which is what we all want. Before he left, he made a huge order on all of the wooden toys that he wanted to buy for Christmas. And Ollie and his son were super excited. But let's just say the luck wasn't on their side right now because later within a few more, later in a few days, Ollie got a newsletter saying that the person who ordered those, all those wooden toys got a bankruptcy file so he couldn't buy them. And this is a real problem for them right now because Christmas is coming up and they won't even have food to eat. So that is something that they need to solve. Even though it was like all hope is lost, his father decided to take the matter into his own hands. He decided to sell the toys by himself. But here's the thing though. Ollie may be a good toy maker, but he isn't a good seller. So he didn't get much money as he wanted, but he did got a lot of, got of food for his kids for the Christmas. Time passed by, their sales are making, the sales skyrocketed, and everything looking okay, even when the second world war broke out. They tried to make a hard time into an easy time. And it seems like things can get worse, right? Well, unfortunately, it did. One stormy night, uh, the wind was so strong, it actually cut one of the power lines, and it burned Ollie's workshop. Ollie, Call the firefighters, but unfortunately, they were too late. Ollie was beginning to lose hope. He lost models, blueprints, and a ton of wood supplies, and he even almost lost his company. But with his inspiration of his children and his workers, he decided to rebuild his factory from scratch. Years passed, he built a new factory, and he built a new factory to produce more wooden toys, and Legos. After that, Godfred, remember that is Ollie's son, decided to go on a business trip to England. When he came back, he met a very, well, not so rich guy, but pretty rich. They were talking about toys. And while they were having a conversation, they got an idea. More like Godfred got an idea. Systems. You see, back in the old days, Legos were, they are popular, but they don't have much systems. You see, back in the old days, you already got the stuff that are provided, provided to you already, and you don't do much work. So he decided to use system inside of those already provided stuff in the world. So he decided to use system into play, which is a very small choice. Even though that idea worked out amazingly, his father, Ollie, passed away sadly, and he never got the chance to see what happened to the bricks he made, which is pretty sad and depressing. But on the bright side, he is now the new owner of Legos. But here's the thing, though. Even though his new invention skyrocketed, he still has to deal with some very, pro very big problems. Since he's alone now, he has to deal with some tough problems such as another fire came through his new factory and he lost most of the wood products and all of those important stuffs. But like always, he didn't lose hope. His workers and his children gave him hope. This time he rebuilt a factory, another factory, I know right crazy, but this time he, he decided to ditch the wooden toys and focus on Lego instead. And let's just say, that was a huge success. Later, his company had gotten so big, he decided to make an amusement park, which is Legoland, which you might have heard before. That is a very good decision, because when Legoland was finished building, it has more visitors than Gotham had expected. It has a total of 600,000 visitors when it, when it first opened. So now you, now you know the history behind it. And think about it, if it wasn't for Ollie's creation and, and his kids, we would never have, have a good toy like this. 
I will. Thank you for listening. I've never had a good toy like this. Good job. All right. Thank you. It's a memorable ending. All right. Our fourth speaker is Amy. Please welcome Amy up. Today, Amy will be talking about the basics of baking, which is baking history, a simple how-to and why you should all be bakers. Please welcome Amy. Don't leave me until I get back.
understand the verses like that. Luke back yet? I don't want him to disrupt you. Our next speaker is Carter. The title of his speech is Why You Should Cube. Today, Carver, Carter is going to talk to us about cubing, how to, and the benefits of cubing. Please welcome Carter.
Our next speaker is, hold on, I think I got him out of order. All right. Our next speaker is Gabriel. Please welcome Gabriel up here. Today, Gabriel will be speaking about why we should ban fracking, the consequences of Oh, the title of his speech is The Consequences of Fracking. Please welcome Gabriel. He's got the best handshake of all the students. Just a second. Wait, wait for me to turn around. As Henry tramped through the woods of British Columbia, he noticed that the river water, which was normally crystal clear, had become murky ever since that oil company had started fracking. He also saw many sick animals, such as beavers or deer, that lived near the river and depended on it for their survival, which got him thinking, is fracking actually good for us? Fracking is a process used all over the United States to boost oil and gas production. And while we may not have a fracking site here in Katy, we won't be able to escape its effects in the future. The fracking process injects water, chemicals, and sand to widen cracks beneath the Earth's surface to extract oil and natural gas. It has become extremely popular since it is cheaper and gives off less uh, gives off left, uh, less methane than normal oil wells, but it isn't good news for the environment. Fracking is toxic to us and the environment as it leads to the contamination of groundwater and it also leads to global warming. The contamination of groundwater is caused by extremely poisonous fracking fluids. For example, benzene and toluene which are cancer-causing chemicals, can leak and contaminate our groundwater. This action contributes to the contamination of groundwater, which harms our streams and our water supplies, creating water shortages and other problems. The more fracking is used, the more chemicals will seep out and pollute our aquifers. These chemicals are also not regulated by the federal government, so the government can't intervene and make the oil companies not frack and prevent the chemicals from leaking out. With the pollution of groundwater, the communities near fracking sites have less water to drink and use. This can exacerbate droughts in places such as California and other drought-stricken states. Fracking also leads to global warming as it releases greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases cause global warming by trapping heat in our atmosphere, which warms the surface. According to Investopedia, fracking has been blamed for leaking millions of tons of methane, a greenhouse gas more potent than carbon dioxide. The more methane released into the air, the faster the Earth will warm. This will have major consequences as global warming causes more frequent and intense natural disasters, which cost millions to clean up, not to mention other consequences such as droughts. Fracking is also using up a lot of the Earth's oil resources. So when we need the oil in the future, we won't have much left, as oil takes millions of years to create and form from Earth's fossils. Another reason why we should ban fracking is because we will be paying the price in the future, not the companies that drill them. These oil companies are adversely opposed to fracking because they can earn a lot of money from it. However, when the consequences of fracking come, we will have to pay the cost in the air. While it may be true that fracking can lower gas prices and boost oil production in the short term, fracking will raise costs over the long run. According to the Frontier Group, these costs range from cleaning up contaminated water to repairing ruined roads and beyond. Many of these costs are likely to be borne by the public rather than the oil and gas industry. And as with the damage done by previous extractive booms, the public may experience these costs for decades to come. While we may save some money at the pump right now, we will have to bear the cost of fracking in the long term, which can range from thousands of dollars to even billions, which will be indirectly paid by us through taxes, along with many other negative pump effects. An example of this is British Columbia. One study found that homes near fracking sites had higher levels of chemicals such as acetone and chloroform, which are both hazardous chemicals to the human body chloroform being a chemical which was used to knock people unconscious. Another study found that methane was able to get into water sources in places with fracking wells. 
Do we, run, do we really want methane, a global warming gas that comes from cows, to be in our water supplies? Since fracking was introduced, many people view fracking as a way to save some money, but this food doesn't save the environment. If we can ban or limit the use of fracking, we, future generations of the environment, will all benefit from this ban. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Emily. Please come up. Welcome, Emily. Wait, wait. Today, Emily's speech is hamsters. She will be talking about her slight fear of hamsters and how it all began. Please welcome Emily. Thank you. And don't begin until I get back. I would run around and do the things I wanted, even if my parents frowned upon it. But when I disobeyed my parents one time, it led to a slight fear. My name is Emily, and today I will talk about my fear of hamsters and how it began. So there was this one day where my mom and I went to visit her friend. I visited often, so when I saw the new addition, a hamster, I got very excited. I played around it with it, having it in my hands. I moved it around, put it into the cage, took it out again, and so on. I thought that the hamster wasn't going to do any harm. But I was, but it was almost time to go, so I had to put it back into the cage. When they started another conversation, I decided maybe I should feed it some seed, I should feed the hamster some seeds. My mom said not to feed the hamster, but as a usual four-year-old, I disobeyed. Now on to the fun part. So as I kept feeding it, along with a lookout to make sure my mom wasn't looking, the hamster started biting my hand. Now it wasn't just one single bite that just peeled your skin a, a little bit. No, it was nibbling on my finger like it was some sort of seed. Apparently, the hamster thought that my hand was a seed due to the fact that whenever it's fed, the seed usually is stuck into the cage. It started bleeding tons and tons. There was lots of blood in my surrounding area. And I mean a lot. When my mom and her friends saw, we immediately got into the car, but the nearest small doctor's place was closed, so we had to go to another one. When we got there, the doctor, ga doctor gave us two bottles of hydrogen peroxide, then told us exactly what to do at home. He bandaged my, he bandaged my hand all around and then also added some hydrogen peroxide into it. It burned a lot. He also told us that we, there will be no shot necessary in, in this case. When we got back to my mom's friend's place, we started doing the treatment, treatment immediately. Finally, when we got back home, it started hurting less, except for the fact that we had to pour hydrogen peroxide onto it. Ever since that day, whenever I saw a hamster, I would say to myself, better safe than sorry. So then now I would avoid hamsters that probably have rabies. Now that I think of it, the hamster wasn't even that hostile. To be honest, the situation could have really been avoided if I just had common sense. My fear isn't really that big, it's just a side one, and it's also kind of gone away by now, so I'm not really scared, just scared of their rabbit teeth. It's also really funny saying that I'm scared of hamsters, but really, some of them are just really not that good. Oh, and if you were wondering what happened to the hamster after the incident, I, it got sent away to some creepy kids next door to uh, my, mom's, uh, my mom's friend's house. 
I lost track of what happened to it, but I just hope that it was flushed out of the toilet or accidentally vacuumed. Thank you. We're more than halfway through. We only have three more stories. Are y'all enjoying yourself? You're not going to die. Nobody has died yet, right? Everybody that came up lived to, to end their story. Nobody has died in any of my classes. And it's not going to happen today. Please welcome Jerry. For Jerry's story today, he's going to tell us about storytelling. Please welcome Jerry. Don't begin until I get back. Applause, applause. Storytelling is a fundamental aspect of human communication and has been a part of human culture for centuries. From cave paintings to modern day films, humans have used stories to convey information, entertain, and share knowledge. Storytelling has the power to transport us to different places, times, and emotions. It can make us feel empathy, joy, sadness, fear, and love. Stories have the ability to connect people and create a sense of community. When we share stories, we are sharing a part of ourselves with others, and this creates a bond that can bring people closer together. Stories can take many forms, from fairy tales to personal anecdotes. The, the best stories, however, have certain qualities that make them compelling and memorable. One of the most important elements of a good story is character development. A well-developed well character is a relatable and can evoke emotion in the reader or the listener. Uh, when we care about the characters in a story, we become invested in the outcome and this keeps us engaged. Another crucial element of storytelling is plot. A good plot is structured in a way that keeps the reader or listener interested and invested in what happens next. A well-constructed plot has a beginning, middle, and an end, and takes the audience on a journey. This journey can be physical, emotional, or both, but it should always have a purpose. One of the most powerful aspects of storytelling is its ability to teach. Stories can teach us about history, culture, and human behavior. They can also teach us about ourselves. When we hear a story that resonates with us, it can help us to better understand our own thoughts and feelings. This can be especially helpful when dealing with difficult emotions or experiences. Another benefit of storytelling is its ability to inspire. When we hear about the struggles and triumphs of others, it can motivate us to pursue our own goals and dreams. Stories can also help us to see things from a different perspective, which can be valuable in both our personal and professional lives. Like the three little pigs. It was once a family of pigs. The mother pig was very poor, and so she sent her three little pigs out to seek their fortunes. The first one that went off met a man with a bundle of straw and said to him, Please, ma'am, please, ma'am, give me that straw to build me a house, which the man did, and the little pig built a house with it. Presently came along a wolf and knocked at the door and said, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. To which the pig answered, No, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. The wolf then answered to that, And I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. So he huffed and puffed, and he blew his house in and ate up the little pig. The second little pig met a man with a bundle of sticks and said, Please, man, give me that stick. Give me those sticks to build a house. Which the man did, and the, pig, and the pig built his house. Then came along the wolf and said, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. No, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff and I'll huff and I'll blow your house in. So he huffed and he puffed and he huffed and he puffed. And at last he blew the house down and he ate up the little pig. Not my the third little pig met a man with a load of bricks and said, Please, man, give me some of, those, some of those bricks to build a house with. So the man gave him the bricks, and he built his house with them. So the wolf came, as he did to the other pigs, and said, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. And the pig said, No, not by hair of my chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in. Well, he huffed, and he puffed, and he huffed, and he puffed, and he puffed and huffed. But he could not get the house down. When he found that he could not, with all his huffing and puffing, blow the house down, he said, Little pig, I know where there is a nice field of turnips. Where? said the little pig. 
Oh, in Mr. Smith's home field. And if you will be ready tomorrow morning, I will call for you, and we will go together and get some for dinner. Very well, said the little pig. I will be ready. What time do you want to go? Oh, at six o'clock. Well, the little pig got up at five and got the turnips before the wolf came, which he did at about six. And who said, little pig, are you ready? The little pig said, ready. I have been and come back again. We got a nice pot full for dinner. The wolf felt very angry about this, but thought that he, could, he would be up to the little pig somehow or other. So he had said, little pig, I know where there's a nice apple tree. Where, said the pig. Down at Merry Garden, replied the wolf. And if you will not deceive me, I will come for you at five o'clock tomorrow and get some apples. Well, the little pig bustled up at next morning at four o'clock and went off for the apples, hoping to get back before the wolf came, but he had further to go and had, climbed, had to climb the tree. So that as he, was just, as he was just coming down from it, he saw the wolf coming, which, as you may suppose, frightened very much. Frightened him very much. When the wolf came up, he said, little pig, what? Are you here before me? Are they nice apples at least? Yes, very, said the little pig. I will throw you down one. Oh. And he threw it so far while the wolf was gone to pick it up. The little pig jumped down and ran home. The next day, the wolf came again, and he said to the little pig, Little pig, there is a fair at Shanklin this afternoon. Will you go with me? Oh, yes, said the pig. I will go. What time shall you be ready? At three, said the wolf. So the little pig went off before the time as usual, and he got to the fair. He bought a butter tree, which was when which he was going home with when he saw the wolf coming. Then he could not tell what to do. So he got into the turn of hive, and by doing so, turned it around and rolled down the hill with the pig in it, which frightened the wolf so much that he ran home without going to the fair. He went to the little pig's house the next day and told him how frightened he had been by a great round thing which came down the hill past him. Then the little pig said, Ha, I frightened you then. I had been to the fair and bought a butter churn. When I saw you, I got into it and rolled down the hill. Then the wolf was very angry indeed. He declared he would eat up the little pig and that he would get down the chimney after him. When the little pig saw what he was about, he hung on the pot full of water and made a, a blazing fire and, just as the wolf was coming down, took for the, off the cover and in fell the wolf. So the little pig put on the cover again and an instant boiled him up and ate him for supper and he was happily ever afterwards. That was a good story, right? Storytelling can take many forms, from oral traditions to written works and even to visual media such as movies and television shows. While the medium may change, the essence of storytelling remains the same. It is about conveying information, connecting with others, and evoking emotion. In today's world, storytelling is more important than ever. With the advent of social media and the 24 hours news cycle, we are constantly bombarded with information. Stories offer a way to connect us, cut through the noise, and make the sense of the world around us. They also offer a way to find common ground. In conclusion, in conclusion, storytelling is a powerful tool that has the ability to transport us, connect us, teach us, inspire us, and help us make sense of the world. Whether it's a bedtime story for a child or a memoir for an adult, stories have power to shape, power to shape our lives in meaningful ways. As we continue to navigate the complexities of the modern world, storytelling will remain an important and valuable part of human communication. Thank you. Did you smile? Did you smile? There you go. Ah. All right, all right. Thank you. Y'all can take a deep breath if you want. It'll take me about a minute to prepare this. Sure. We have two speakers left. Thank you. 
Can you help? Yeah. I don't know. There it is. It's coming back. Hold on. TV is turned off. Do you want to restart now? So you have your notes over here, and you should be all right. Come on up. speaker is Taran, and the title of her speech is The Pig and His Parrot. Have you ever heard of a poem so good that you decided to write a story about it? Probably not, but she has, and today she will present The Pig and His Parrot. Please welcome Taran, and don't begin until I give you an notification, okay? okay. pig and his parrot. There once was a pig. There once was a pig who danced a jig. The pig danced the jig at the galloping hooves, the local bar for pigs, cows, and horses. No chickens were allowed. After the very lively jig, the pig saw a shop called Carrots and Parrots. And out of curiosity, the pig went into the shop and he got butchered. And, no. And he bought a carrot to tame a parrot. The pig and parrot decided to go on a pigs and parrot swing, and then turned on Human Boulevard, which always is a bad sign because lots of animals get butchered there. After the parrot and the jig, the pig, the pig and his parrot saw a sign so divine, they had to walk towards the sign. It might butcher them. It read. Roblox Gaming Competition. Play Murder Mystery 2 and sign up right now on the sport. Only 50 players max. You can choose your partner on the day of the competition in the lobby of the game. Obviously, there's no partner mode. No pigs, sheep, cows, horses, mules, dogs, or cats. Chickens are allowed. Entrance. But the very old dancer pig and his dancer decide to fight the rules and sign themselves up. <laughs> Once the pig and parrot got back home, they immediately signed up on their newly bought Carrot 14 Pros, the latest iPhone model, with the usernames Totally Chicken 1 and Totally Chicken 2. They were ready. Well, not completely ready. The rules were very simple. The game must be played in Murder Mr. 2 partner mode. As I said earlier, there's no partner mode. I'll just do that. Part. No pigs, sheep. Cows, horses, mules, dogs, or cats are allowed. Finally, no Robux game passes, Robux items, or Robux items. Since none of them knew how to play the game, they spent the entire night playing, learning how to play, and dying. The day of the competition came, and the pig and the parrot were totally ready. After five grueling rounds of the game, the winners were revealed. Totally Chicken 1 and Totally Chicken 2 has won the competition. Gamers, Totally Chicken 1 and Totally Chicken 2, 
Please go to Instapay to claim your reward. The peak and his pair at one in the sky. With a cash prize, the pig bought a rocket that fit in his pocket. With the pocket rocket, the pig and his parrot decided to go to the moon to prove a myth. So pig and parrot left their house, went into a nice little clearing, and then popped out the pocket rocket and went inside. The pig and his parrot were gone, off to space. After three minutes, they were back with astounding information. The moon is made with cheese, the cow really did jump over the moon, and there are chicken aliens out in space. And after their three minute ad long adventure, they ran merrily all the way back home. After two years, they got bachelor. The end. Thank you. Let me turn off everything. I saw it go by. Did you see it go by? I saw it. There it is. All right. All right. Thank you, Turan. Our next speaker is Reedy. Please welcome Reed. All right. So today, Reedy, the power of a smile. Today, Reedy will pre be presenting a speech on the powerful effects of a smile and how they affect our lives, our health, and us on a day-to-day -day basis. Please welcome Ruby. Thank you. Thank They smile back. Or when someone smiles at you, have you caught yourself smiling back? This is because smiles are actually contagious. So how does this work? Well, according to an education innovator called Amanda Fay, she states that our brains are hardwired to mimic expressions and respond to positive physical cues. And your brain controls this. Say that someone is smiling at you, and this is your perfect person. A warm, fuzzy feeling starts from your mouth and travels to your heart. Say that your heart is not used to this feeling, then it becomes tight on your sternum. Even though your heart might not know what to do, your face does. It responds with the other person's face. All of this happens because of near and near bombs, therefore making our body hardwired to mimic expressions. But just how contagious is a smile? It's actually more contagious than the flu. That's right. When you smile, your body releases chemicals like endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and many more. And no sooner or later, there will be chemically induced happiness in the room. Smiles may be contagious and make others happy, but what can smiling do for you? First of all, smiling can relieve pain. According to a dental clinic in Michigan, the endorphins released when you smile send a message to your brain to lessen your perception of pain. There's also another chemical called a neuropeptide that works to fight off stress and help your body relax. Smiles do a lot for you and other people, but all of this works with fake smiles as well, not just genuine ones. A recent study by the University of Southern Australia showed that even a fake smile can have a positive impact on someone's mood. This happens when you trigger certain facial muscles that trick your brain into thinking you're happy. When muscles say you're happy, you're more likely to see the world around you in a positive way, says human and artificial cognition expert at University of Southern Australia. But fake smiles aren't everything. When our brain looks at a smile, 
a real smile. The hippocampus takes emotion and stores it as long-term memory, Bates and Emma think. She says, when you see someone smile, you store that memory in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus says, hey, that person made me feel good. I will remember them fondly and be attracted to them. So what she's saying is that when someone gives you a real smile, it impacts you forever. And it increases your attraction to them, no matter who they are. I hope my speech gave you a new perspective on the things your smile can do, whether it's face or gender. Remember that you might be making a difference in someone's day, especially when it's genuine. So maybe if you at the grocery store, give a heartfelt smile to the cashier and see if they smile back. Or maybe even a stranger on the street. You don't know the impact you might make in one small gesture. You can try this out by smiling right now at the person next to you. See how contagious your smile actually is. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget to keep smiling. Glad you ended it with a smile. Very appropriate. Happy birthday, girl! Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good job. All right. All right. What did y'all think? What did y'all think? I think that they all deserve another round of applause. Each and every student was able to showcase a story that they wanted to share with everyone. So we've been working on vocal variety, we've been working on moving around on the stage. They all accomplished e just a little bit each and every technique that I've been talking about. Now, when you're in a room where all the parents are, when you're in a room where you don't know anyone, when you're in a room where fear starts to creep up and strangle your vocal cords, these students all overcame their fears. Even though they were afraid, none of them died. Not a one of them. So each and every one has a fear of public speaking. Practice, practice, practice helps overcome our fears. At this time, I would like to acknowledge all of our students, so I, I'd like to ask the To The Top Education team to come up and tell what they have planned for their students this summer. They have a speech camp and they have a whole program coming this summer. They have some flyers they'd like to share, but I'd also like to give out their uh, certificates, but I'm gonna organize them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need to stall for about <laughs> two minutes. All right. At least two or three. Yeah, minutes. we will have the the public speaking and the debate summer camp in the May. We will have two sessions. One session is uh, June fifth to ninth at one two five. Four hours uh, each day in the afternoon, uh, basically weekdays. And the second session will be the following week. So if any of you are interested in going further and uh, uh, practice, keep practicing your public speaking skills and get into a debate, and uh, this will be a perfect for you uh, to, uh, to attend.
Wait, that's your sister? Okay. That's your sister? Wait, that's your sister? Okay. Did she ever Just ask me. Alright. We always come back to the picture after and then we'll be done all right so we'll be done a little earlier than expected my first student up here is Amy so please come up smile pretend like you like me there you go there you go thank you all right Emily Now everybody goes, yay, it's over. Yay. yay. It's over. <laughs> Come on, one more time. Yay, it's over. Yay. yay. Use the book of variety. Yay. yay. There you go. All right, thank you guys. Y'all did well. I'll be sending my, my evaluation notes soon. I should have been busy. Oh, you did. Thank you. Yes. Why don't I have I don't know. Ask me. Thank you. I don't know about my dream. 